When you read the Bible, you find people eating all the time, especially Jesus. His first miracle, at a wedding feast. Later, a few months, he feeds thousands of people on a hillside with kids for the kids' lunch. Jesus ate with his disciples and sinners. Jesus ate with his enemies. Jesus ate with the poor and the elite. In the book of Luke, Jesus taught 23 parables and 17 of them had something to do with eating. When he wanted us to remember uh, his grace and his forgiveness and his sacrifice on the cross, what did he pick? He picked a meal we call communion. He chose eating as the way to remember what he'd done for us. If Jesus is in the story, expect there to be food or someone to be eating. Jesus was my kind of guy. Jesus loved to eat. <laughs> Actually, Jesus loved to spend time with people, and people we love to eat, right? There's something about being at a table with friends, and sitting around, talking to each other, and eating. It just makes everything better. And Jesus, eating at tables with people, he taught them a completely new way of living. At a table with food, he showed them a new way to follow God that was gonna be liberating for them and transformative for all of us. He welcomed them to that table no matter who they were, what they had done, or where they had been. Now, I love to eat with people. Heidi, my wife, she enjoys cooking for others, I love Heidi's food. This is a marriage made in heaven. We're perfect for each other. We love good food shared with good people. Y'all, I, I love Heidi's good food with bad people. I just, I love it. <laughs> and most of you do the same thing. Even at our holidays, are associated with food. New Year's, what do we do? Black eyed peas and ham. Yep, yep. Thanksgiving, turkey and dressing. Yep. Christmas, turkey and whatever that junk Aunt Edna cooks every year, that, that's for you as well. Birthdays, well, they have cakes. Valentine's Day, you better include some chocolate, sir. Fourth of July, we celebrate America with hamburgers and hot dogs because nothing says patriotism like a good hot dog with some ketchup on it. Yeah. Easter, we eat bunnies and eggs. <laughs> Actually, if you think about it, we do. Chocolate bunnies and eggs is what we eat, right? Yeah. I think you get the point. Eating together. Together is just as important as eating. Families sit together at a table. And at our house, we, we don't have a big fancy table. Like a dining room table you're not allowed to touch. That may be you and your family. You're, I'm grateful for you. But for our family, we just have a plain kitchen table. In fact, this is our kitchen table. So um, I may need to be coming over later for this with Heidi. Um, it's up here all weekend. Uh, our kitchen table's not special. It's just, well, it's just a brown kitchen table. Here's where I've spilt some stuff on it. It's got knife cuts and gouges. It's got, the stain is coming off on the legs. I think the chairs have been recovered at least twice. The edges are worn. You see, Heidi and I, we're just not fancy people. We're, well, we're brown kitchen table kind of people. Um, at holidays, Heidi decorates the table, sure, but most of the time, it has mail and magazines or the kids' school stuff, and she didn't know this picture was taken either, so I definitely am gonna need to come over later and have lunch at your house. <laughs> our, our girls do crafts here. They've decorated cakes and cookies. Our lives are lived around this kitchen table. I'm getting old enough that, that things are attached with memories and things become more important and I don't wanna get rid of this table because here we planned Morgan's College. Here we talked about vacations and we did homework together. We made major purchases. Kitchen table moments for our family are moments where we share, where we talk, where we laugh and well, we decide. We live here, we, we make important decisions. We do business at this table. I love this table. Not because it's fancy, but because of what's associated with it. I love the kitchen table moments that have happened as we've sat around it. Now Jesus, Jesus had a kitchen table moment with his disciples. We call that moment the Last Supper. We call it the Last Supper because it was his last formal meal with his disciples. And the kitchen table moment for them was at a holiday called Passover. 
Once a year on Passover, Jews remembered how God had saved them and set them free from Egypt. And they did it with a special meal. And every part of the meal, from the way they did it to what they ate, was rich with symbolism and had deep meaning. Um, Think of it kind of like Judaism, Thanksgiving, and Easter all smashed into one holiday meal. But Jesus turned this once a year celebration into a kitchen table everyday moment. The Passover was a reminder of what God had done to save his people, but the Last Supper is a reminder to us of what Jesus is doing to save us. It was so significant that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all write about it. John said the teaching of Jesus was so rich, and so he gave four whole chapters just to Jesus' teaching in that meal. And it starts in John chapter 13 this way. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them, check this out, the full extent of his love. That last phrase is incredible. Can you imagine the power of Jesus showing you the full extent of his love? incredible moment for the disciples. But truthfully, you and I don't have to wonder about that because Jesus has shown us the full extent of his love. It's called the cross. He demonstrated his love for us. And if you only get one thing from this weekend's message, if you only get one thing right now, but if you've learned this message, it's this. Never forget Jesus loves you. It has been decided. The decision has been made. There is no wavering. Jesus loves you. You, God isn't up in heaven trying to figure out, well, you know, yesterday was pretty rough. Do I love him, do I not? He doesn't look at this crowd and say, you know, I'm, I really love Tyrone, I really love Kevin, but, but Steve, not so, we're, we're not, we're, the jury's still out on that. No, Jesus loves you. If you had to pick a song, sort of that embodies the theology, the, everything it means about Jesus and God to us, we, we have lots of hymns that we've sung through the years. You, you could choose a song like Amazing Grace, How sweet the sound that saved a what? A wretch like me. I once was lost, but thanks to being to God, what I am now found. I was blind, but now I see. You might pick something a little more modern. You might talking about who Jesus is, and aren't you thankful that Jesus is a way maker, a miracle worker? He keeps his promises. He's a light in the darkness. But there's probably no more theologically accurate, no, no more theologically profound or rich and deep in meaning of what it means to serve Jesus and to know Jesus than the, kid, the song we learn as kids. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Would you uh, close your eyes for just a second? I've got a lot more left to say. But maybe everything that's going to happen this weekend is for this moment for you. Maybe you feel unloved. Maybe someone has even said, I don't love you. You feel worthless, you feel broken, you feel left out, and you feel unloved. And maybe you question if you're even the kind of person that could be loved. I believe God has a word for you. I believe I'm here right now to give you a word from God. And it's this, Jesus loves you, this I know, because the Bible tells us so. Little one, you belong to him. You are weak, but he is strong, yes. Jesus loves you. Yeah. Jesus loves you. Yeah. 
Jesus loves you. The Bible tells you so. Now as a testimony to the world, and maybe more importantly, a reminder to yourself, would you just sing that with us? Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so little ones to him belong they are weak but he is strong yes Now look at what happens next and how Jesus showed them the full extent of his love. Verse three, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he'd come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Now Jesus, who the Bible says had all power and all authority, God-given power, washed the feet of his disciples. He humbled himself and did the dirty job so that others could be clean. I love this about Jesus. He isn't afraid to get his hands dirty to make me clean or his children clean. And as you can imagine, the disciples in this moment, they were shocked, they didn't know what was happening. Peter even tried to stop him, but Jesus kept going. The night before Jesus was crucified, the night before his greatest challenge, the most difficult part of his journey, he focused on others. If there was, if there was ever a moment for Jesus where he, he could have said, you know what, let's just have a, a time for me. If there was ever a pity party moment for Jesus, the night before he was killed would have been a good option. Like, it would have been okay at this point, I think in my mind, if he'd said, guys, like, it's been a great couple days, but can we just have some Jesus time right now? Like, we just need some Jesus time. We need some, me, Jesus needs some me time right now. It's been tough. That miracle yesterday whew, took a lot out of me. Tomorrow, you guys don't know it, but it's gonna be tough. Could you guys just take care of everything? I need a break, but not Jesus. Jesus didn't do that. Even in the, facing his greatest trial, Jesus put the disciples before himself. At the table, when you're with him, know this, Jesus always puts you first. Now, my mama and papa, they were, they were simple preachers from East Texas. They never had a lot of money. We didn't go on big trips or fancy vacations with them. You know, my memories of them are from their house at a kitchen table like this. At this kitchen table, I shelled lots of purple hull peas. I still have little pieces of green left over underneath there. If you don't know what that means, you should discover it. Uh, we, we cracked walnuts and pecans. We, we, we canned jelly. We talked. We played and prayed. We, we played board games. We, not cards, because cards were a sin. But we played Monopoly, because that wasn't. <laughs> Greed was okay. It was gambling that was bad. Tell it like it is. <laughs> Some of you had memos and papas too. <laughs> but most importantly, we watched Mamma make biscuits at that table. I can smell those biscuits to this day. We aren't talking that abomination known as canned pop biscuits. We're talking about real, homemade love rolled into the biscuits. We're, we're talking about real biscuits. You know the ones where the sweat from Mamma's brow 
seasoned and make it taste like heaven. You know, where our hands were inside of it. They're, they're like that, like butter just rolled off their brow. And you know that kind of butter. She'd get up at, um, I'm preaching up here. Some of y'all just need to go on. That's right. There you go. She'd get up at 5.30 or 6, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning and she'd make biscuits and bacon and eggs for us. She made sure we all had enough before she sat down herself. She was always the last one to eat. And after breakfast, the rest of her day was devoted to getting supper ready, usually chicken fried steak. You thought I was done preaching, but I've got more, y'all. It's coming. <laughs> Creamed potatoes. I'm talking about the potatoes that come from the ground, not the ones from the box. I'm talking about real potatoes, you know, the ones God made. And then she'd finish it off with red velvet cake. Thank you, Jesus, for red velvet cake. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me right now? <laughs> At supper, she was the last one to eat as well. I have a clear memory of us all sitting around laughing and eating and Mama standing against the kitchen wall near the stove with her plate eating because everybody else had already been served. With Mama, it was her kids and her grandkids first, always her last. You might say it this, Mama was a whole lot like Jesus. Now that's a country western song if there ever was one. <laughs> People in songs should do something with that one. And Simon Sinek uh, wrote a book where he said, leaders always eat last. He described as senior Marine Corps uh, leaders would wait as junior Marine Corps leaders ate first. It didn't start with the Marines. It started with Jesus. Others first, me last. Jesus, God's son, puts you first. You're the most important thing to him. Paul explained it this way. Jesus, who lived in heaven, who sat on a throne, angels gathered around singing him, worshiping him at all times, left that to come to earth so that you could get to heaven. He chose pain-free, worshipful setting for suffering in the cross for you. But Jesus does one thing further in that moment for the disciples and for us. Jesus not only focused on others, Jesus focuses you on others. He told us we're to do the same for each other. In verse 12, he said, do you understand what I've done for you? Yes, and you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, now you should also wash one another's feet. Amen. I have set you as an example that you should do as I've done for you. Jesus told them, I served you, now you serve others like I served you. <laughs> How much better would our world be if we all served each other the way Jesus did? How much better would our world be if just the church served the world the way Jesus served us? How much better would our community be? How much better would we be if every time we came here and every time we left, serving others was the thing that was on our mind? Now, I'm talking about more than just being polite. This is more than just holding the door open so someone can go in front of you or letting somebody cut in line in front of you in Starbucks. Those are, those are good things and a good place to start. But this is more than that. It means giving up your rights for the sake of others. It means giving up what you deserve or what you've earned, so that others can get what they don't deserve. It means letting go of your privileges and benefits. It's becoming comfortable with, I have less and you have more. Now it's easy to put people first you care about. It was easy for Mamaw because she loved us. But what about the people who hurt you? The feet that Jesus washed would be the same feet that would run away from him and abandon him in a few short hours. Jesus even washed Judas's feet. Others first includes our enemies and those who've hurt us. Your ex who took half of what you own, the woman who lied about you at work, can you put them first? The family member who abandoned you, can you still do what's right by them? How about the politician who voted against your beliefs and now that vote now costs you money. Can you put that person first? Well, that's impossible. Really? Because Jesus summed it up this way in verse 34. A new command I give to you, love one another, and notice there's a period. No qualifier, no descriptor, 
just a period. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus loves you. You know this because the Bible tells you so. But you're supposed to love others, and you know this because the Bible tells you so. If you hate people, you aren't violating a suggestion. No, love is a command. And that's how people will know that you and I are with Jesus. Not by the church that we go to. Not by the Christian t-shirt that you wear that you got on sale at Mardell's. Not by the leader you elect to office. They will know that you are with Jesus because you love like Jesus. Jesus loved them. Now you go love them. Others first. You last. Now those four disciples... It had been a roller coaster journey the last few days. Start of the week, they come to Jerusalem, shouts of praise, worship, everybody's clapping their hands for Jesus and for them. They walked into cheering crowds. And then, then Jesus begins to form, form miracle after miracle. It's amazing. He confronts hypocritical leaders. Uh, he, he confronts those who are oppressing other people. Uh, things are just going amazing and wonderful. And Jesus brings them to a kitchen table moment at the Last Supper. And he gives them an important but difficult conversation. Jesus says things like, uh, he, guys, I'm going to die. Guys, I'm going away. And I can't, you're not going to be able to go with me. At one point he says, you're gonna, one of you is going to betray me. Then he said, you're going to face persecution and death. And they're like, what in the world? Confused. They begin to ask Jesus questions. Betray you? No, no, it's not going to be me, Jesus. I wouldn't betray you. Lord, you said you're leaving. Where are you going? What do you mean we can't go with you? Lord, just why aren't you showing everyone who you are? I don't get it. At one point, remember, after he's washed their feet and demonstrated sacrifice and service, while Jesus is teaching, at the other end of the table, the disciples get into an argument. Who's the best and the greatest amongst them? Yeah. And when they can't get that solved, they interrupt Jesus at great teaching. Hey, can you tell us which one of us is the greatest? We notice you started with Peter. Is that him or is that my like better? Like, they're, are you kidding me? Jesus is like, you missed the whole point of the foot washing thing. Yeah, yeah. And yet their questions, they don't intimidate Jesus. Jesus doesn't even get on to them very much for their foolishness. And I love this about Jesus, because when you're sitting at the table with Jesus, Jesus answers your questions. Because questions aren't bad things. Questions lead to answers. It's okay to ask God your questions. God isn't nervous about your questions because he has the answers. He's not struggling to come up with it. It's not suddenly you ask something, he doesn't know the answer. He turns to Gabriel and says, hey, Google that real quick. I don't know what to do. Jesus doesn't reject your questions and Jesus won't reject you when you ask them. Maybe it's been a difficult time for you and you don't know why. And you just wanna know, Jesus, why? The person you love died and it doesn't make sense to you. Your plans, which you've prayed about, you've given to God, they didn't work. Why? It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to come to him. Give Jesus a chance. Now, from our perspective, these disciples, they look really foolish asking Jesus questions after he tells them specifically what he's going to do, and then they ask why. After he'd given them his words, and they still don't do it, and they look dumb. But if we're honest with ourselves, Jesus has given us his word and we still ask questions about it. We do the same thing. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. But then we ask, Lord, you, you don't mean my actual neighbor. Have you seen what Ralph does with his trash? <laughs> he, he doesn't mow his yard enough. I don't have to love him. This, this is just kind of like imagery, right? Or Jesus says, share what you have with the poor. And then we say, but Lord, you don't mean my actual money. Because that's a metaphor for life. Like I want to live a life of sharing without actually having to give anyone anything. God tells us to leave our jobs, go to Europe as a missionary. And then we ask, but Lord, this is just a willingness test, right? Like if I say, Lord, I'm willing to go, that's enough. I don't actually have to go. I can give the money and I can pray really hard. God tells us not to have sex outside of marriage. 
then we say, but Lord, it, it's okay if we really love each other because God is love. And because we love each other, we're really like married in your eyes, right? You see, when we ask God questions, we be, better be ready because when we ask God questions, he gives us answers. Even the answers we don't like because at the table, Jesus always tells you the truth. Those truths that help us, truths that we love and we want to hear, and some truths we don't. Listen to some of the things Jesus said to his followers at the table. Verse 21, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. That had to be a conversation killer, didn't it? And Peter said, well, promise, oh, nope, Jesus, not me, I'm gonna die for you. And then my translation of the scripture, Jesus says, will you really lay down your life? Dude, I tell you the truth, three times you're gonna deny me. Then he goes on and he says, this world will hate you. He told them, you'll be persecuted. You'll be killed. You're gonna go through stuff that you can't even imagine. Because when you sit down at the table with Jesus, he tells you the truth, even the truths you don't want to hear. The hard truths about yourself. The relationship that you are currently in that is destructive, he will tell you it's time to end it. The unforgiveness that you hold in your heart and you, you've held that grudge against people, that person for so long, Jesus will say, let it go and forgive. He's honest about what you will go through while serving him. Jesus tells you the truth. But Jesus also tells us the truth about himself. Because Jesus in that same conversation promised those disciples, it will be hard, but I will be with you through it all. Remember, when Jesus tells you the truth, he loves you, but he always puts you first. And sitting with Jesus, it's easy to become more and more aware of your own failures and shortcomings. Because when he exposes the truth in your life, you think, what in the world am I going to do? Your sins and your mistakes, they become overwhelming. And there's shame and there's guilt. And you wonder, what am I supposed to do about that? But I have a great news because the most important lesson we learn at the table with Jesus is this, Jesus forgives you. Because when most of us think of the Last Supper, we, we think of communion. And there in communion, we eat bread, we drink juice to remember Jesus' death and to remember his forgiveness. Matthew 26 tells us that this table is a table of forgiveness. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it all, all of you. This is the blood, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. See, Jesus' table is a grace-filled table. I'm struck by who was sitting at that table. Over there was Peter, who in a few short hours would deny him. Thomas, who in a couple days would doubt that he was actually alive. But at every seat around that table were people who would abandon him. Yet, despite what they were about to do, each were invited to the table. They weren't kicked out, they weren't excluded. No, they learned about grace and mercy and forgiveness because Jesus loved them and put them first even above their own failures that would be an attack on him. Jesus forgave them before they'd even offended him. And that invitation is yours today because here at the table with Jesus is forgiveness. Whatever you've done, he will forgive you. Passover was a special once a year holiday for Jews, but Jesus turned it into an everyday kitchen table moment for us all. Jesus' table is for everyone, every day. And when you and I take communion, we sit down at the table with Jesus.
and we sit down with the millions of other Christ followers and disciples throughout history who've sat in communion with him and each other to remember I'm forgiven because he was forsaken. He forgave us. And we take communion because Jesus said, do this to remember me. I'm so thankful that there's a place at the table for me. Because I've done some stuff that if I had to pick the list, I probably wouldn't include my own name. (laughs) But I don't pick, he does. In just a moment, we're gonna take communion and we're gonna remember together. But before it's served, I wanna give you a chance to receive God's forgiveness. He's asking you to come to the table with him. Would you join him? Would you sit down at the table with him? Would you close your eyes for just a second? Jesus invites you to the table. Maybe there's a part of your life that is broken and filled with sin. There's an area where you need grace and forgiveness. Maybe for you, this is the, really the first time that you are gonna place your hope and trust in Jesus. You, you'd say, I'm not following him, but I am. I want to do that now. I wanna give you a chance to respond to the invitation to come to the table. If there's an area in your life, maybe you say, I'm following Jesus, but Randy, I'm just making mistake after mistake and sin has a piece of my life that is just holding on to me and I I need grace and forgiveness there. If that's you, either one of those areas, maybe if it's the first time or something that you've done before, would you just lift your hand for a second so I can pray for you? If you're watching online, you can just ask for prayer there. One of our team and pastors will pray with you. Now, would you let me pray for you? Jesus, thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy. And thank you for hope. I pray for each of us who struggle with sin, who struggle with weakness, and we turn to you, the one who is strong, the one who loves us, and the one who can give us forgiveness. Now, would you help my friends uh, to abandon the lifestyle that has pulled them away and to follow you with their whole heart, to live in grace and forgiveness? Lord, would you, would you forgive us and make us whole? In your name we pray, amen. Our ushers are coming to serve you communion. If you wouldn't mind, if you would wait to take it until all have been served. You don't have to be a member here to take communion because we believe everybody's welcome at the table.
communion has been celebrated and remembered in many ways throughout history. It's not just um, the activity or how you do it as much as what we remember and what he has done in our lives, what he has done to transform us and change us. It is his grace and his mercy. See, when Jesus took the bread, he broke it and said, this is my body, eat it. He was saying, this bread symbolizes my body and what I'm about to do for you. Saying, I'm I'm going to be hurt so that you could be healed. I'm going to be punished so that you can be free. I'm going to be broken so that you can be made whole. And what vivid imagery God gave us by taking his body and crushing it with our own teeth. So would you take this bread with me today and remember the one who was broken so that you could be whole. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that I'm whole today because you chose to be broken so long ago. And then he took the cup. He said, this is the blood of my covenant which was spilled for the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus was saying, the penalty for your sin, I'm about to pay tomorrow. Your place in death, I'm going to take your place on the cross. Your sins that will destroy you, I'm receiving so that you can be complete and whole and forgiven. Would you take the cup with me and remember his grace and forgiveness? Jesus' words at the end of that were, do this in remembrance of me. I think Jesus was saying, never leave this table. Keep coming to the table. Keep thinking about my forgiveness. For his disciples, he was saying, guys, you have no idea how much you're going to need this because you're about to all abandon me. But even as you run away, remember, the table is open for you to come back. Jesus loves you. He puts you first. He'll answer your questions. He's going to tell you the truth, but thanks be unto God, he forgives us all. I don't know about you, but when I take communion, my, my visceral response is to lift my hands and my voice. I want to stand on my feet and I want to say, thank you, Jesus. Lord, I love you. Would you do that with me? Would you just begin to thank him? God, I love you more than anything. Thank you for grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, God, that I was lost and broken, and you found me, and you made me whole. Thank you that I was out on my own, and you chased me down, and you brought me back. Lord, when I left the table a mess, you brought me back home and complete and whole. And Lord, today, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. Now, would you worship with us? as we say to God how thankful we really are.
the goodness of God. We serve a faithful God. Have a beautiful, beautiful week. Remember, the deepening is here. Pray for our students. It's going to be awesome. God bless you.